So just so that we have a record of it afterwards, we'll upload this on the NTC YouTube channel so everyone can access it moving forward. Um, there's gonna be a lot of great information covered today, so I know people will wanna use this as a resource. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. Um, we are excited to have you here for the NTC Sales and Business Development Peer Group event, Boots on the Ground Business Development. And I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Lauren Hensley, and I am the Director of Program Strategy for the NTC. Um, I'm excited to see a lot of new and familiar faces on the call, so just really looking forward to have you guys interact with our speakers today and learn more about what it takes to get your business up and running. Um, we're also joined today on the call with my fellow uh, Sales and Biz Dev Planning Committee members. That includes Amanda Banks, Rob Wilson, Don Ostell, and Matt Fredericks couldn't be here today, but um, just thank you to everyone for helping us plan such a wonderful event for the attendees and uh, for being on the call to help participate as well. Um, we've got a lot of exciting stuff to cover today. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our two amazing speakers for the event. All right, so today's interactive discussion will be led by co-founder and CEO of DeBanks LLC, Amanda Banks, and her professional colleague, uh, founder and CEO of New Resolution Technologies, Justin Denherter. So Amanda, Justin, wave hello to everyone. And I'd love to give you some brief background on both of our speakers. So starting with Amanda, she has been in the tech sector for going on 20 years and is an innovative leader with a record of success in sales, healthcare, technology, and especially creating strategic partnerships. She is a seasoned enterprise sales leader, um, and she believes that every conversation is an opportunity to make a positive change in the lives of others. So I'm really excited to hear more about uh, her insights into growing a business. And our next speaker, Justin Denherter, has been a leader in the technology industry uh, for the past 22 years. So a little over 11 years ago, he recognized the need for technology to serve people rather than the other way around. So his response to this need was to leave his job in the corporate world um, and grow his own business from the ground up. And I'll quickly give you some highlights on the two businesses that our speakers have started. And I know that they'll go much more into, into uh, detail in the presentation. But first we have Amanda's company, The Banks LLC, which was founded just this year in 2021. So congrats to Amanda on getting that up and running. And she has set up her organization to partner with individuals, companies and communities, just to connect them with the resources that they need, um, execute their special projects and help grow their businesses really from step one. Um, for Justin's company, New Resolution Technologies, he started this back in 2015, and they help uh, connect clients with the technology partners that they need um, and guide them through the process of saving them time and money to find the right resources and solutions for their businesses. And I know they're gonna share a lot of great insights with you all today on what it took to get these two companies up and running and how building strategic partnerships like the one that they share together um, has added to their successes over the years. So this should be a great discussion. We wanna make this as interactive as possible. So I will encourage you all, please write down your questions for Justin and Amanda as we go along. We're gonna intersperse some Q&A sessions between each topic and um, it should be a great way to get involved and, and don't be afraid to speak up. So without further ado, Amanda, Justin, I will turn everything over to you. Wow, thank you. Thank you. Justin, do you want to get started? Why don't you just share a little bit about New Resolution, kind of how you you got New Resolution off the ground? Yeah. Wow. So um, New Resolution was, uh, first of all, I would just like to say thank you. It's an honor to be here. Uh, and it's an honor to share anything that, that we can in order to help all of the attendees on this call, wherever you may be or however you may be thinking about starting or continuing uh, in whatever phase that to, that might be. 11 years in total of not working in a corporate America job, you learn a lot of things along the way. Uh, you take a lot of licks, you get a lot of success, uh, and you go through some pretty crazy dry spells, you know, in through, you know, through times and every once in a while you get a bluebird that lands on your lap. So, you know, um, Amanda, you and I, right, we met through, uh, we met through a private organization that we both joined, 
uh, where we were immediately uh, promoted into a higher level of um, leadership within that organization that really spun off to where our, where our engagement is. So for those of you that out there that don't think that networking works, right, or being a part of like certain things or organizations, um, they take time. It takes time and development in order to be able to get to know somebody, to earn their trust, and to be able to speak into their lives. But ultimately, that's where Amanda and I came together. We were part of a, a, private, a private organization that we were put in leadership uh, positions together, and that really showed uh, our strengths and we were able to match those strengths together. And in return, that created a partnership between our two businesses. So when Amanda and her and her counterpart decided to make a transition uh, of becoming independent and leaving corporate America and doing all of those things, it was a good opportunity for us to sync up and have a conversation. And that's what we did. And we ultimately decided that it was a good idea to, to pair up, to pair our, our companies together and figure out how we could be a powerhouse in that manner. So it was, it was pretty, it was pretty cool. But Amanda, I mean, like, um, I might, I don't want to bogart the whole thing. So if you want to talk, you want to take the tech, I'll talk forever. Right. But yeah. if you want to take the, the next, uh, the next bullet, I'm, I'm totally happy with that. Well, I, well, I do want to dive a little bit deeper into the networking aspect. You know, Justin and I met about a year prior to us even having these conversations around, you know, trying to find a partnership opportunity. So from the networking perspective, you know, a lot of people want to have a conversation with people and then immediately find ways to do business with other people. And that is not how this worked. Justin and I truly spent a little bit over a year just getting to know each other and trying to explore uh, ourselves as humans and, and how can we potentially bring value to each other. And so although we did work uh, we did meet in a networking capacity. Like we spent about a year just getting to know each other prior to even having conversations around business. And so I think that when you talk about, you know, how did the conversations start and how did we work through the structure? You know, we started that through a friendship and getting ready, getting to know each other. And so, you know, if you're doing networking events or if you're meeting other people, try to keep in mind that these things don't happen immediately sometimes. And sometimes you truly have to dive deeper into a friendship and getting to know those people prior to jumping into business conversations. And yeah. so, you know, how did we get the conversation started around the partnership? Well, Rupa Deloach and I basically started the banks on a napkin in the Cool Springs Mall. And we decided that we wanted to make a bigger impact in the world. And through that, we wanted to do it through partnerships. And so as Justin was, you know, working in the technology space and as Rupa and I were launching our company, there was direct alignment in regards to the things that we're looking to bring to market, as well as the relationship with, with Justin that we already had. And so when we started talking about the, the partnership aspect, you know, we had a good solid friendship. We understood what we needed to do to take the conversation further. And we were able to formalize that partnership very easily, but it, it didn't happen overnight. So I want everybody to keep that in mind. Amanda, can I, I would like to um, just add a little piece to that from the networking aspect. If there's one thing that I've learned in networking is, you guys have probably heard this a million times over again, but the reason why the relationship clicked so well is that we both came to the table with something to give, right? And so like, in, and if you want to start off a relationship with authenticity and being genuine, then having something, whatever it may be, in order to give to that other person without this expectation of receiving, right, turns into a level of appreciation and allows a conversation to happen you know, without the wanting and the asking and what most people do in a networking aspect, right? Most people are in there to take. And, uh, and you really need to be in there to give in order for people to truly see your character, not who you're trying to be, you know, because that's ultimately the way that a relationship starts to develop. And Amanda and I have been extremely um, vulnerable with each other in the relationship. And we've also been very honest and forthright throughout the entire relationship and engagement. Um, and that, that says something about, 
your character, who you are. I'm not trying to lecture to people or anything. Please don't take that in any manner, anybody here. I'm not, you know, but um, you, will, you, you can identify those that come in, especially in the very beginning, you can identify those that are there just to hand out a business card looking for a deal. You know, and that is a really terrible approach, especially if you're starting a business because you're not giving anything in order to be able to create a level of engagement where people will take interest to you. So I just wanted to add that piece, Amanda, because that was really critical in our beginning synergies as far as the conversations, you know, and not every conversation that you and I have had have been easy conversations, right? But being transparent, being upfront, and being honest with each other has really helped us you know, in, in what we, what we're doing. So thank you. Yeah. And the, to put this in the context of just partnerships in general, you know, when you're looking to establish new partnerships in business or have new clients, you know, that synergy is really important, you know, having the vulnerable conversations, the tough conversations, the things that sometimes we don't necessarily want to discuss, um, having those conversations to make sure that you're establishing a partnership on good terms that is healthy, that is going to um, move everybody in the same direction and the direction that you guys establish is so insanely important. Um, I know all of us have probably had clients where we're not in direct alignment with them or partnerships where we were not in direct alignment with them. And so in establishing this partnership, you know, we really had to think through, are we in alignment? Are we working to the same goals? Are we, you know, are we going to structure this to where there's a fair exchange for everybody? Um, and, and that's incredibly important. Mm. Mm. I agree. We could sit on this slide forever. And if that's <laughs> all that it is, because these questions are, they're such amazing questions in order to really kind of talk about you know, business development, right? So Amanda, you're, you're 100% correct. So nobody's an island, you know? So whether you're a true entrepreneur um, or whether or not you've had an entrepreneurial seizure, right? And we can go into that later. Um, most people have entrepreneurial seizures, right? They're not really entrepreneurs. They just wanna be business owners, you know, where, and that's the misconception of an entrepreneur, you know, like, Amanda and I have had entrepreneurial seizures, right? Where we think of an idea and we think that it's amazing, but we're really in it for the long play, the longevity of it. Like we're in it to grow it and make it something. We're not in it as a, as a true entrepreneur would be, is to build it, make it successful, sell it, and then move on and do something again and do that wash, rinse, repeat, right? You know, and so the toughest part about it is if you're truly just moving into a business, uh, an owner operator or owner investor, you know, you have to make sure that you don't buy yourself a job. And that's what happens to a lot of people in those scenarios is you invest a whole bunch of money to be a prisoner of your business. But like how we worked initially through the structure. So you're not an island. Nobody's an island here and nobody can do it alone. I don't care how great you are. Good luck. Right. I'll just I'll say that to you right now. And that is a trap and it's a lie. And so everybody here just needs to like, if you are trying to start a business or you're trying to do whatever, you may be the founder, right? But you are never an island and you'll never get it done on your own, you know? And um, I don't care if you're a famous athlete or whatever, everybody else has had somebody else come around them at some point in their lives in order to guide them and bring them to a point to where they see the success, but nobody does it alone. And probably one of the most critical mistakes that any that I made myself, a terrible mistake, is you don't begin with the end in mind. You know, and that is something that a lot of people, when you're, when you're getting into a partnership or you're going into, into business with your family or you're going into business with your friends or you're doing all of these things, you get so excited about the business, you get excited about what it's going to be and how it's going to turn into and all the lives you're going to impact and all the money that you're going to make. And then all of a sudden, somebody doesn't want to do it anymore. And then you're left with no exit strategy. You have no buy-sell agreement. You've created an LLC together. You've created a joint venture. You've done all of these things, but you never, you never began with the end in mind. And in most cases, and in my case, like I lost a wonderful and amazing you know, relationship with a friend that turned out to be a terrible business divorce. I lost a lot of great clients. I lost a lot of great revenue, right? And I went into a fight that I never really ever anticipated. 
Uh, and that was very costly all the way around. It turned out to be very ugly. And most partnerships end up that way because they don't begin with the end in mind. You don't think about what it is in one year, two year, three years, five years. You don't think about what that's ultimately going to look like. So you don't plan for it. And when you don't plan for it, a lot of times what ends up happening is somebody wants to exit prior, or maybe you're just not in as much of alignment as what you thought that you were, or maybe something in your life significantly changed. You know, but whatever that is, if you don't have an exit strategy and you don't have that set in place, you are literally creating a recipe for disaster. And if you see any partnership that doesn't work, it's because they didn't create an exit strategy. They didn't create a buy-sell agreement. They, didn't, they did, didn't sit down and have the tough conversation with each other of what does this look like when we're done? Or what does it look like when we've gotten to our target, right? And that leads me to the second thing, no targets. I tell you what, you know, you, you know, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. <laughs> like it's pretty easy at that point. But uh, I, I don't, I don't want to go on a big long rampage on this. But uh, it's, it's, uh, it's only through experience that I share this with everybody here. That um, the probably the toughest thing in working through a structure is moving through how it's supposed to look like at the end and what the exit looks like at the end. So that when it comes down to disagreements, that you have something that you've formalized on paper and that you both have signed, right? That says, this is how it's going to end and there's nothing to contest. And that's what keeps it, that's what keeps it real for everybody because then there is no fight because you agreed upon it in the beginning. And, it, and you can end relationships and businesses, relationships in business, I should say, um, amicably without, without having to get in attorneys involved, having to fly to different places, without having all kinds of other junk and garbage, you know, put against you. Like I could tell you this whole story. I'm not going to divulge it here, but it didn't end well. Uh, and I hate the fact that it didn't end well. Like that's, it, that's always been something and it stuck with me in, uh, in that lesson. Okay. So something to note, something to note is always make sure that you incorporate past experiences to make sure that moving forward, those things don't happen, right? Whether that's through, you know, partnerships, whether that's through, you know, formalizing things with clients, like always make sure that you're learning through your mistakes. And I know that that's something that everybody's heard a million times, but it's true, right? Because the goal is to make sure that as you're moving forward, that these things don't happen again right? Lessons learned. And so always make sure that you're going back and you're kind of reviewing all of the things that have happened and you're putting in processes and procedures so that those things don't happen again, right? And that you're surrounding yourself with incredible people that are vulnerable and willing to do the same. Um, and so I, I, I want to take a, a second because there's been a lot shared here and we're going to continue to share a ton, but I would love to see if there's any questions um, in regards to the partnership aspect. So I would just like to see from a raise of hands, like has anybody formalized a partnership where they feel like it's been an uber successful one? Like I would love to see from a raise of hands, like who's established incredible partnerships and has been through that process before? Let me see, can I see who's raising their hands? We've got Jeffrey having raised his hand. I don't know if he wants to share his experience. Yeah, I would love if, if he's open to sharing his experience, I would love to hear, you know, from your perspective, like what made that partnership successful? There's also a question that's come through too from uh, Chris Christie. Is there any way that we can open up Jeff, uh, unmute him, Lauren, so that, uh, cause he's just, should he text the answer or can we give him auto, uh, audio? Hello, can, can you all hear me? Yes. Great, nice to meet everyone. 
Um, yeah, myself is a startup founder. I'm uh, I was O for two with with my first two ones and kind of didn't didn't want to get back into it. Was in the corporate world. Then I met the uh, co-founder of my company, Hot Doc, um, John Liu, and really really talented guy. So we were kind of kicking around the idea while I was still in the corporate world for this. And uh, for the first time, you know, doing a startup, I'm working with an A. So he's just uh, extremely talented, uh, makes up for a lot of my weaknesses. And I feel like my strengths make up for his weaknesses. So um, he built a mobile app platform. He built the UX, designed it. I helped us raise the money. Um, he deals, you know, with, with the clients and I find new strategic partners. So we, uh, we work really, really well together. Mike, you said earlier, uh, it's not good to, to be an island with my first two startups. You know, one, I had 10 employees, but it was all me to figure everything out. So he uh, just does really well. We have an exit plan in mind. So, you know, a number that it hits where we've agreed upon that's. <laughs> yeah, those are good things, Jeff. Yeah, I mean, like you learn a lot, don't you? When you go through a few of them and you kind of, you take your licks and, and uh, you get smacked across the face a few times, you wake up. Right. Absolutely. My uh, my second startup, I worked with one of my my very best friends in the world, and he couldn't do a lot of the stuff that he said he could do. And, you know, it was a uh, was not good. So, you know, yeah. like you mentioned, it's good to have everything laid out and just very, very lucky to have John as as a partner. Well, thank you so much for sharing. So John Liu is amazing. I am a huge John Liu fan. So that, just throwing that out there. Um, we do have another question from Chris that says, how do you explain this to skeptics how partnerships are about multiplication and not subtraction? Ooh, that's a really interesting question. Yeah. Justin, I'm gonna let you run with this one. So can we get, can, can, so I would like just a little bit more context around Chris specifically, right? So in other words, it's and, not lost revenue, it's a force multiplier. Gotcha. Gotcha. You know, that's always um, typically uh, individuals that are looking at that scenario, right? They're not looking at the bigger picture. They're not looking at the famous quote of the fact that if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together, right? And I think that a lot of times, especially in the beginning of a partnership, and you're starting a brand new business that has no revenue and nothing generated, the biggest fear that people have is money. How am I going to survive? Right. You know, in that ultimately, like you had mentioned here in the for, in the forced multiplier aspect of it is it is, it is, it, it is a multiplier. That's why it's so good to have people around you that compliment you and you compliment them. Right. So nobody wants to have a whole bunch of people that do the same thing because then nothing gets done. Right. Like if Amanda and I didn't have the other two, Cindy and Rupa, grounding us in what we were doing, you know, we're like the mad scientists up above the clouds where the sunshine is always where it's always sunny. Right. And I'm not saying that Rupa, Rupa and Cindy on the other end are the doom and gloom, but they're more realistic. Right. You know. So take everything and throw it on a whiteboard and then start and start erasing the things that aren't going to really work. But in this case, you know, Chris, I'm not exactly sure, like as you're mentioning from lost revenue, but what it sounds like is it sounds like there's an internal problem with the people that you're dealing with. The internal problem is, is that is that the money aspect of probably what they're looking to do seems smaller because it's a share across multiple people. And it may not be enough in order to be able to make ends meet. And that's and that needs to be talked about. That's the only thing that I can really think about. But if, if there is enough passion, and what I mean by passion, passion is not like you're on fire and enthusiastic every single day. I think that's a huge misconception. Passion in what I've learned and what I have been taught is the willing to endure the pain and suffering in order to get across to the other side, right? And so you could also be in a position where fear is driving those other people more so than their, their passion to endure the pain and suffering in order to be able to get across the other side because everybody faces that, you know? And so that's, um, you know, and that's, that's a psychological game 
right? You know, it's got nothing to do with what you're actually trying to, what you're trying to achieve. Um, and usually that just requires an open conversation. So if you haven't had the money talk, you know, that's usually the biggest thing. That's the biggest thing that we all worry about is the money and um, in, in your words, you know, not lost revenue, but, you know, force multiplier. Yeah. If you're all working in unison and pushing forward in the same direction, it is a force multiplier. Even in that scenario, even a blind squirrel will get an acorn every now and then, right? Like it's, you know, like, like that will work if you're all rowing in the same direction. I, I hope that helped, Chris, because Chris, I, I don't have a whole lot of context. So I'm just kind of taking from experience and partnerships, you know, in, uh, in what I've had. So if, if there's anything else that you'd like to engage in, or if that hopefully maybe created some cl you know, clarity, feel free just to respond back in the text box. That, that would be awesome that at least we hit somewhere around the mark. Right. Well, and this is a great like transition over to the actual like boots on the ground grit business development side. Like this is a great transition to that. Um, so I think, you know, when we're talking about business processes and starting sales from and business development from the ground up, like there's a lot that goes into that. You know, Justin's had a successful business for a long time, but through the partnership, we are essentially starting from the ground up. We're starting that partnership from zero. And so, you know, in, in talking through some of these things like establishing systems and technologies to make it happen, you know, a lot of what we had to explore was how do you take two separate companies and create some type of cohesion between the systems and technologies so that we can st just start like and that's part like we're, we just needed to start and so you know establishing the systems to make that happen the technologies and the, to just start the cold outreach process you know the reality is at least what i've experienced in entrepreneurship so far is that if you don't pick up the phone and make your phone calls nothing is going to happen like we can sprinkle magic fairy dust and we can say as entrepreneurs that these things just magically happen but the reality is, is in sales, you have to make the calls. Like you have to pick up the phone and get in touch with these people. You have to schedule events that will bring people together to help drive sales revenue. It doesn't matter if you've had an uber successful business or you, you're starting a company. You have to do those things. The more outreach, the more events, the more existing connections that you can build and relationships that you can build, the more opportunity there is. So I would love to sprinkle magic fairy dust and say that this is the magical process and this is everything that we've done to be successful. But the reality is, is all of us, regardless of position, have to pick up the phone and make the phone calls. Amanda, you don't have fairy dust? I've got a cage over here filled full of fairies. Well, that's awesome that little, because little I've been doing it the hard way then, right? <laughs> like <laughs> I've been sitting here under the whole grit and determination and making this thing work and you've got fairy dust. So please share. <laughs> Some of us, you know, are just blessed with that kind of, uh, you know, I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. You couldn't be more right, you know? And I think that that, comes, that goes back into the, into the thing of passion, right? Like if you're not willing to endure the pain and suffering in order to pick up the phone, to talk to somebody, to make some of that cold outreach, to create those level of introductions, it's never going to happen for you, right? You're not going to just sit there and will it into existence, right? Like you have to step out in faith, you know, learn, grow, and start asking a whole bunch of people why they decided not to do it with you. The more no's that you can get answers to, the better off you're going to be. Don't be afraid of the no, right? Like that's like, that's the worst thing that ever, rejection is amazing because it teaches you so much about what worked and what didn't work. But more than anything else, skip the, skip the cheesy sales tactics, you know, get away from the cheese ballness and everything else. And just be yourself. That's probably one of my, you know, one of my biggest struggles, right? Like, because uh, I, I got, I was brought up in this space old school, you know, like I came up in the space pulling doors, you know, going from door to door in my, you know, in my professional career of launching 20 years ago, you know, as, as a salesperson carrying a bag, right? Like all our job was, was pounding the phones and pulling doors, 
you know, and um, like you have to really put on what I call your alligator suit and get ready for war. Like you've got to have the thick skin uh, to do that. Um, the first bullet here, uh, establishing systems and technologies to make it happen. Honestly, I wish we could just go back to the heat facts. Like that would be so much easier today than dealing with the multitude of technologies. Uh, every business is a technology company, regardless of what they do, right? Every business relies on technology today in systems to some degree. And systematizing is really good. Like you have to systematize your business, right? Having standard operating procedures is important, even if they're basic, because then everybody knows what they're doing. If you're starting a brand new business, creating your SOPs isn't always the easiest task, but just document as you move along. Like you're probably not going to sit down in a big brain dump and just roll out all of your systems as far as how your business is going to operate and what it's going to do. But as you take your systems in 90 day chunks and just continue to keep reiterating them, you will be able to move through and create some really good systems that work well, you know, and you will get rid of the systems that don't work well. Now systems on the other end, you could be looking at technologies like CRM, databases, you know, um, different kinds of email and automation tools in, you know, the, uh, the flux capacitor on the, you know, on the DeLorean in order to be able to go back into time. You know, like there's, there's so many things that, you know, back, that was my back to the future reference that those of you, I, I know, I'm, I may, don't let this baby face fool you, I've been around for a while. Um, you know, but, the, but don't let those systems drive you mad. If they don't serve you, if they don't serve you, get rid of them and shed as many as possible because your job is to grow your business and to make happy, satisfied customers, not to manage a whole bunch of online systems that drive you nuts that don't interconnect with each other. Dump them, right? Shed the complexity and bring yourself down into simplicity. Use what works and get rid of everything else. Don't even second guess it or think that maybe it might do something for you. If you haven't touched it, use it, or don't like it, get rid of it. Like that's all that I could say because otherwise you're gonna bang your head against the wall and then eventually you're gonna ask yourself the question, how long am I gonna bang my head against the wall before I realize it hurts, you know? And initially in the beginning of starting off, like Amanda and I, you know, coming together, we had a huge issue with technologies, right? Because she likes Google and I don't. <laughs> I am not a fan of the Google ecosystem, right? Like I like, and please, that's just my own personal bias. Don't attack me if you guys are Google lovers, right? Like that's not the, that's not the point. I just particularly don't like Google's ecosystem. I don't, I don't care for it. I find it kludgy and I find it difficult to use. But on the other hand, Amanda loves Google. So also be sure that you can create a win-win environment, especially if you're teaming with somebody else so that you're not trying to run somebody else over when you're using these different technologies. Because when you come together, there's gonna to be a culmination of all kinds of stuff that you've been using on your own that you'll have to eventually filter through in order to get everybody on some kind of level of cohesiveness in order to make it work. But I mean, but guys, we all know what the basic systems are. Like you should have at least a basic CRM in place, right? You know, you should have some kind of database management tool, you know, um, depending upon how your prospecting is, you might want to just invest in an inexpensive list in order to get some names of some people, you know, and then be authentic in the way that you might be reaching out to them if you're going to try to launch, you know, email campaigns or unsolicited email campaigns or whatever it may be, but just real simple basic systems. And if your system and technology is as simple as a spreadsheet, that's okay, right? Like you don't have to spend gobs and gobs and gobs of money and take this from experience from somebody that has spent gobs and gobs and gobs and gobs of money to scrap things that just never work. Test it, make sure it works. If it doesn't work, get rid of it. Don't even think about it anymore. Shed it and move on. Um, that's, I mean, that's, that's my advice of literally filtering through a million different types of technologies. And I'm totally happy to like um, give any advice to anybody that's thinking about a certain level of technology because Amanda, you and I have probably from that aspect have touched it somewhere along the line. So if anybody wants to throw any responses in, you know, we'd be happy to, to take a little bit longer on this, uh, on this bullet. 
Yeah, I, I do want to talk a little bit as well about some of the successes that we've had from a business development standpoint, um, because I think it's important for people to know, you know, just based on our experience, what we've seen successes in. And so, you know, I want to talk a little bit about cold outreach. Um, we've done a lot of cold outreach and I can't say that we've seen a significant amount of um, success in that. But what we have seen a significant amount of success in is scheduling webinars where we do announce from a cold perspective events that we're hosting where people can come and attend. They're online at this point and they can gain some type of knowledge. So we're doing a cybersecurity six week webinar series that is specifically designed for small and medium sized businesses. And we've got 300 plus people that are interested in attending that. And that was all done from a cold outreach process as well as LinkedIn, um, which brings me into a direct outreach to existing connections. So my biggest business development tool is LinkedIn. I do most of my biz dev leveraging the power of LinkedIn. And over the course of probably three years, I've built LinkedIn and quite a following, but what that has done has allowed me the opportunity to schedule webinars and to gain influence from that and to have people attend those events. So I would highly recommend that if you're not putting a lot of effort and energy into social media, you should. I don't use Twitter, I don't use Instagram, I don't use some of these other platforms, but I do use LinkedIn. And it's a great approach to get people to attend, to get knowledge, which then will drive them to, to your way. Um, so if you're doing direct outreach to existing connections, like definitely leverage the power of social media for that and start developing those relationships. Yeah. Um, also attend events and networking, you know, in Nashville, we're opening up, which is super exciting because people are starting to do in-person events. And I've met so many incredible people through networking events where kind of like Justin, you know, we met each other, we got to know each other a little bit better. And then we started having business discussions along the way, but it takes the energy <laughs> to actually make the cold calls and schedule the webinars, do the social media pushes and attend the events. But that energy will, multiply in ways that you can't even imagine if you're putting forth the energy and effort to do it. Yeah. Um, so I do want to take a couple of questions in regards to that. I don't know if anybody has any questions about, you know, these specific processes or what we've done where we've seen success, um, specifically on LinkedIn or social media, um, but would love to hear from everybody else, you know, what's working for you? <laughs> What have we not said that you're seeing success in? Because we are, I mean, we just, I just launched the business and I'm, I'm very excited to hear what other people are doing that's working. Uh, Amanda, and while we take, I would like to add one more thing into, you know, into that, but I, I want to just, how many attendees do we have? 22, we have 22 attendees. So I would like to add something else to that um, while um, individuals are thinking about, um, their question. So I'm going to give them the time though to, to put their question first. Yeah. Corey Cox just said events on LinkedIn are a great approach there. I mean, we've seen a lot of success in that so far and the more we're doing, the more success we're seeing. Yeah. Justin, are you ready to throw in a dad joke? <laughs> what CRM do you recommend for B2B enterprise sales? Um, so Amanda is a huge HubSpot fan, uh, and I personally like Pipedrive, but I think that they're both great products. Um, HubSpot has a free, a free, um, a free version, which if you're starting off can be really amazing, um, and has all kinds of different integrations based upon what you want to to APIs that you want to integrate with, uh, and Pipedrive. Uh, it doesn't have a freemium, I don't think, but it's also a very easy, quick setup CRM that you can get your data in. Uh, so we both had great experiences with those. We've tried some other ones. 
uh, throughout the years. You know, if you're a startup, Salesforce isn't for you. I'm sorry, Salesforce people, unless you really think that is, but it's a lot of money to license, uh, you know, and there's a whole lot of stuff for you to figure out with Salesforce. And uh, that's kind of one of those complexities that you may not need to start off with unless you're really going to do all the modules in Salesforce. And that may be the same with like Dynamics 365, the Microsoft product. You know, that's got a whole, those are extremely powerful businesses um, for enterprise sales and what you're asking, Jeffrey. But, um, but dependent upon your ability to be able to hire other people in order to really get you to run those things right, you know, they may add a level of complexity and cost that may not be justifiable. But if you're in that, that phase and you need all of those modules and you need that real deep level of, uh, of reporting off the dashboard, those are great. You know, Salesforce and Microsoft Dynamics are amazing. You know, the Dynamics 365, those are fantastic. But if you're running a small sales team, you can probably get by with uh, uh, um, uh, Intricately or Pipedrive or, you know, a small paid version of HubSpot or something like that. I hope that helps. Yeah, I'm a huge HubSpot fan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, the free functionality is really good. Um, so you get you know, especially from a startup perspective, you know, we're, we're bootstrapping the business. So when looking at different technology platforms, you know, cost does play a part in it. Um, and I get the functionality that I need in HubSpot. Um, and I'm able to do what I need to do at this point. Now, as we grow the business, as Justin said, there's a lot of other resources and tools available, but as it stands today, HubSpot works really well for us. Jeff, did that help at all? I, I, I'm not sure the size of your business or the space that you're in. So we really kind of, you know, awesome. So one of the things that, um, that I would like to just talk about really quick, you know, from this before we move into the, the takeaways of the word that I think that everybody wants to barf on right now, which is the word value, right? Provide value, provide value, provide value, provide value, provide value, provide value. You know, and that's kind of the thing that everybody is constantly saying. We're hoping that this is value driven, right? Like in, in just us having a real conversation about our experiences and where we are in our careers and what we're doing. Um, and Amanda, you've got a question here from Nigel. Uh, let me just finish this. Um, whether you're selling a product or whether you're selling a service, take the position of a reporter. Just be a reporter, right? Like a newscaster reports, um, a newscaster reports things that are happening, whether locally, you know, nationally or internationally. And I think that like, if you want to provide value to your current clients or prospects or whatever that position is, I think that if you just take the position of a reporter instead of the position of a salesperson, right, then you can provide value in the products that you're selling, right, in positioning by actually just talking about what they're going to do to make somebody's life better, make their job better, right? And make their company better. You know, nobody cares about the widget. Nobody cares about what you're selling. What they do care about what they're going to get from it and how it's going to accomplish those three things. And so if you move your position into being a good reporter, even if it's just a simple $5 product, right? Like it doesn't have to be overly complicated. It's just something that you do in order to change the dynamic in the way that you're engaging with somebody. Because that is a really easy way to create value where you are selling, but you're actually providing something to somebody. So exactly, build an emotional hook or connection. You know, you're, you're absolutely right, Corey. You know, because that creates the level of authenticity. It also shows your genuineness and the fact of what you're actually trying to accomplish and what you're trying to do instead of just trying to move a widget, right? Lots of widget sellers out there. Lots of people out there that are just in it for the money. And I'm hoping that the people here are in it more for the money because they actually truly want to help somebody else on the other side. And I think that that comes through, like that will give you more power and it will take the sales pressure off. You know, some of you may have a quota. I get it. I know what it means to have to put a number up on the board, right? I know what it means to be under pressure to feel like maybe you have to run over your grandmother for a deal. That's a bad place to be, right? Like that is a horrible, horrible place to be. Shift, become a reporter, talk about what it's doing for people that you know. 
If you don't know what it's doing because you're brand new, go find out and model what it's doing for somebody else. Like you don't have to recreate the wheel. Just be good at, at figuring out what it is and start asking questions and being inquisitive. I just wanted to put that part out there, Amanda, because I know that a lot of people like that's one of the biggest things that everybody talks about is the value proposition, the value proposition. And I'm so tired of hearing about it in the space. Like it's not a complicated thing. Just be a good reporter, go out there, figure that out, ask some good questions, and then just run trial and error in what you're doing. Thank you. That's super powerful. Um, okay, so Nigel wrote, in using LinkedIn as a channel for business development, how much attention are you paying to engagement on a granular, granular level? Are you generating call lists from folks who engage, or is it more about building brand? So for me, um, the way that I leverage LinkedIn is to develop relationships. You know, we've all been remote for so long that we, I had to figure out a way to develop new relationships and LinkedIn is a perfect platform to do so. Um, so I do pay a lot of attention in regards to engagement for the business. So I did create a business page for DeBanks, please go and follow. Um, but I do pay a lot of attention to that specifically because I wanna see what's resonating with people, you know, from a business perspective, what are we talking about that's making sense to people, what's not making sense and then adjusting accordingly. You know, I wanna make sure that the messaging that we're putting out there from the business perspective is resonating and is really showcasing what we are trying to solve for. Um, are we generating call lists from folks? So I have generated call lists, yes. Um, I will say that in generating some of those lists, you're given limited information. Um, so you've gotta be very cautious. And to me, it's more about building relationships than it is about pushing product. Um, so I'd rather find the people or have the people find me that are in a direct alignment with the things that I'm looking to achieve and the things that I'm looking to get involved in. And at that point, we develop a relationship. I don't push product. Um, in fact, one of the approaches that I have on, on LinkedIn specifically, and I'm happy to, to set up a time with anybody to discuss LinkedIn and how go into detail about exactly the processes that I use. Um, but one of the things that I do is I do not reach out to anybody unless I know that I can help or serve them. So if you're sending messages that are just cold outreach messages saying, this is the product and service that I sell, let's find a time to chat, that has never worked for me. Yeah, unless you have a really good joke that did work once for me. But how many times did you do it? You know, How many times did it work? You know, so, you're absolutely right. I mean, LinkedIn is unfortunately to a big degree has turned into just another big spamming, you know, like there's not of, um, uh, it doesn't really, it doesn't res resonate, but there is one tactic that does work right through like your connection. So Amanda, you are way better at LinkedIn than I am. Like you dwarf me right in connections. My world has been spent more with the longevity of relationships that I've had over the past 22 years of being in this business which hasn't forced me in order to create a super strong social presence, right? You, on the other hand, are like literally a super connector and uh, like and generate more connections than, uh, than I've seen in anybody else from just your approach and the way that you do it. You do a fantastic job. But I, one of the things that you can do with your existing LinkedIn connections is if you haven't connected with them or you haven't spoke with them, but you are connected, and you've never had any dialogue, start reaching out by just saying, hey, like this is crazy that we've been connected um, uh, since April of 2015 and we have never spoke, right? Like I would love to chat with you and just see how we can help each other. Like that kind of, like there's a sense of warmth in there uh, and I have done that and I've gotten responses out of that and I've gotten people that have come back around that have said, yeah, that's that, that's great. Let's connect at this time or let's do that. Because I mean, most of us, let's, let's face it. Most of us who started our LinkedIn probably did it off of spamming 18 million people in order to figure out how to get them in through our connections. But now you've got 18 million people that you're connected with. So now we have to start figuring out how you're actually gonna build genuine relationships with these six degrees of separation. And you have to start in a very simple way that starts to demand an action, right? Like you have to have a call to action to them, but do it in a manner where they know you're not spamming them. You can't spam the date of when you connected, right? Like you can't, you can't do that, you know? Like that's, that's, 
um, like that's not, then they're going to know that you're just spamming them again. But that one simple, we've been connected since this month and this year specifically nails down to the fact that you're sending them a genuine message. I don't care if you copy and paste it, right? That just reverts to the fact that you actually took the time to send them something that isn't just the spammy outreach that most people get. And there's so many, uh, uh, Amanda, there's so many others. Corey, um, dude, I love your question, right? Uh, but that is a really big question. And I don't know if we have enough time <laughs> in order to really dig into that. Justin, uh, do you want to take that question? And do we want to maybe follow up with, um, yeah. Nigel's got one as well. And I know we've got five minutes left. So I, I do want to make sure that we take these questions, but maybe we follow up in regards to those. Yeah. Um, I do yeah. want to leave you guys with a couple key takeaways. Like these are super uber important and something that I think that everybody could find value from. So one is everything is constantly evolving and changing. So um, I had the opportunity to participate on a TV show two weeks ago, and I had the ability to work with a group of 10 amazing people to solve a global issue in four days. And the one thing that I took away from that is that time is so insanely precious. And if something is not working, you have to move on. So having an adaptive mindset is critical. Um, some things work and some things don't. There's not an exact magic that works for every single business. Like you have to do trial and error. You have to put forth the effort and the energy to make sure that you're figuring out what works and what doesn't work. But, but if you're not putting forth the energy to make the calls, to set up the events, to do all the things you need to do, you're never going to know what's working and what's not working. Um, alignment with partners and companies is critical. Um, we've dug a little bit into this, so I'm just going to leave that one as is. Um, Justin stated, you cannot do everything. Understand weaknesses and help with other things. Um, outbound effort is exhausting, but the only way to build the business. Everyone, regardless of position, is involved. So when you're growing a business, I don't care who you are. If you're in finance or in your operations, like everybody's responsibility is to grow the business and do outbound efforts. So I know we're coming up on time and I don't know that we have a lot of time left to answer any questions, but we did want to leave you guys with these five key, key takeaways. I think that these are things that Justin and I have both learned in our journey as entrepreneurs um, and things that we've actually implemented in our own businesses. A couple, like a couple of additional things too. And Nigel, I think I can answer your question. So everything that we're at, as far as like changing, you know, from the sales paradigm and me, you know, where did that come from? Or, or are there any uh, thought leaders out there in that space that, that are doing that? Absolutely, right? Tony Robbins and Dean Graziosi are the ones that created the knowledge blueprint and shifting into a reporter mode in order to be able to help you. There isn't, so one of the things I think that, that that's not on this list is the, you're in, the investment into yourself, right? You know, and what everybody will tell you, if you're not learning and growing, you're dying. And so if you're not constantly evolving and changing and adapting, right, then you're probably dying. And so, and what that means is that, is that the world, unfortunately, right, is not going to stop. It's going to keep revolving around the sun, you know, and I'm not saying that you have to take every single moment and make it about your business, because that is also a lie. You know, if you were a person of faith, that should come first, right? Your family should come second. Taking care of yourself and investing in yourself should come third. And the last should be your business, because out of all of those things, the only thing in those four that's a rubber ball is your business. And if you drop your business, for whatever reason, it will bounce back. But if you drop the other things, those are like glass balls and they can become tarnished or break. Yep. And those are hard lessons throughout life when you're looking at this. And I know that this is all about business, but in what we're talking about here, but really at the end of the day, guys and gals, seriously, like business is a rubber ball. It's always going to bounce back. You know, none of you have probably have ever been in a position long enough to where it didn't bounce back to some degree. You may have had great success. You may have losses, 
But a lot of you, like me, have made sacrifice your faith, sacrificed your family, and sacrificed yourselves in order to create the success in business. And that is a terrible position to be in. You know, so I just, I, I wanted to share that part about it because that investment in all those other people is what makes it worthwhile. That's why you're doing this. Like if you're just getting up in the morning to make money, that sucks, right? But if you're getting up, right? Like one of the things that somebody said to me, like, I don't work for anybody. I work with people. I don't work for any company. I work at a company, right? The people that I work for are the people I love, the ones that I want to support the ones that I want to be with, the ones that why I want to get up in the morning and do it. And I mean that sincerely. And so, you know, taking that frame of mind uh, changes the dynamic and the reason of why you're putting in the time that you're putting in. But don't make those sacrifices. It took some hard lessons in my life in order to be able to come back around to understand those things. So, uh, Amanda, I just like that part wasn't on there. And I really, I wanted to express that piece of it because I really think that that's important, you know, that we don't no, just it, it's totally, and- totally important. And, you know, I, I really appreciate you sharing that. Justin, I appreciate you joining today. Um, you know, there's a couple of things going on, guys. Like, make sure to reach out to connect with Justin and I. We would love the opportunity to connect with you and to hear from you. Um, we are hosting a cybersecurity event that's geared towards small and medium-sized businesses. So definitely check out that event on LinkedIn as well. We'd love to have you there. Um, and we also want to hear from you. Like our goal, and sorry, Lauren, I'll, I don't know if you want to take this or if you want me to take this, but our goal is to provide you guys with opportunities and events that are going to make an impact in your life. And so we would love for you to submit just some quick information on a sales and biz dev feedback form that's um, the link is on this page. I don't know if you want to put um, more in the link link in the chat button or in the chat space as well. But our goal is to make sure that we're providing events um, that bring you guys value. So definitely check that out and please give us your feedback. Yes, please, everyone, just take a few moments. It's only a few quick questions and there are no wrong answers. This past year has thrown us for a loop and we want to make sure that we're kind of taking a temperature check to make sure that we're offering the programming that you want to hear about, that you want to engage with, and that can help grow our local sales and business uh, development community. So thank you to Amanda and Justin so much for today. This is so engaging and we covered so much ground. So I know that some of you who have questions in the chat will make sure and do follow up. And I can even send out a link to the recording of this session later on today. Um, so you have it as a reference, but thank you so much everyone for being here today. Thank awesome. you. Thank you so much, Lauren.